Alpha.
meet Swift's latest RGBW panel innovations, the Van Gogh 70 and Van Gogh 100 LED panels. The Van Gogh series uses exclusive edge-mounted RGBW SMD LEDs, which results in an extremely thin 21 mm LED panel that is fanless, making zero noise on set. The Time Division Drive technology makes Van Gogh up to 60% brighter than its competitors in RGB mode. You can count on extreme color accuracy with a very high CRI and TLCI. Thinner, lighter, brighter, and quieter, these are the Van Gogh Ultra Slim RGBW panels by Swit. We are introducing the AWUE160. This is truly a groundbreaking PTZ. We have a newly developed 4K sensor and this new sensor technology allows us the highest sensitivity within a PTZ on the market today. In addition, we're the first to introduce an optical low pass filter built into the PTZ. What we also did with the UE160 that's so revolutionary is that we completely redesigned the mechanism in which the PTZ moves. It's much smoother and much more accurate. Hello everyone, welcome to Pro V T V. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, quite a few people watching this one so far at the start, which is nice to see for considering this is not a new product launch. Um, so let us know down in the chat where you're watching from, what kind of work you do. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Everyone who's watching this, it'd be great to see. Um, 
as we go through the stream, as always, I can see exactly what you guys are saying in the chat here. So let's get the conversation going. Any questions that you want to ask throughout we as we go throughout the slides and all the rest of it, just leave them down below and we will we will get to them as as fits. Um, but I'm joined today by Tom from Canon. How are you, Tom? I'm good, thanks. Are you? I'm very, very good. good. Um, so this is our first live stream with you. Firstly, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. How long have you actually been at Canon? Uh, well, I've been working with Canon now for almost seven years. So, seven years, wow. Yeah. So floating around events, usually you see my face scattered mm. about. But um, yeah, recently in, in this role now. Um, on the still side, on the cine side? Um, or To move on to the cine side, so a pro video specialist basically since November. Um, so now, yeah, anything video related, usually I'm there. First yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They wheel you out. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have me on uh, speed dial. <laughs> We've had some fantastic... So Dusseldorf, we've got Romania. Oh, fantastic. Wow. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. So what are we? what's the idea behind the stream today, Tom? What, what, are, we, what so are we talking about? The whole idea today is we're all about R5C. So we're basically seeing um, or talking about why it's still relevant, um, why you should be still interested in this fantastic product, um, and also um, focusing a little bit on what the latest firmware, which has literally just been released, um, mm. brings to this camera, because there's a lot of exciting stuff that's now been added in. Is this... The second or the first main furge, may, major yeah, firmware? I think this is now the, the second. second. Yeah, there's been a lot added since since launch. So you guys have been great with doing recently. Like the C70 mm. has had so many, you know, RAW was added to that camera, all the autofocus improvements were added yeah. to that camera. The C70's had a huge amount of upgrades mm. and it's nice to see the R5C getting yeah. the same kind of treatment, yeah, which is great. Right. Yeah. Absolutely great. Well, here we go. We've got Spain, commercial director from Spain, Charles Alexander. Mm. And Palestine, wow. wow. Every, people are watching from all sorts of places today. <laughs> Global audience. Fantastic. Um, should we not waste any time and jump straight into the slides? Sure thing, yeah. Um, so just a bit of background, really, on our Cinema EOS range. So this is currently where our lineup now sits. So before the R5C was introduced, we had the C70 as our introduction to the cinema range, so our first RF cinema camera. Um, mm -hmm. And then working our way up, so like our C200, our C300 and C500, which are our modular cinema cameras, and then our production level mm -hmm. uh, C700. Um, but what's interesting now is the R5C sits there at the um, the entry to the range. So if you're looking to mm -hmm. have a, a compact cinema camera that's actually hybrid, this is the first one that sits within this range. So a quite special product, really. Absolutely. I mean, um, the others don't even take any stills on them. They're not hybrid cameras at exactly, all. Exactly, yeah. Are, yeah. So I for those that still... screen grab, but... Yeah, exactly, yeah. So for those that are still wanting fantastic photos, but a video orientated camera, then the mm -hmm. R5C is kind of the one for them. Um, so that's kind of uh, what we're saying here, really, is in, in terms of positioning them hybrids, a lot of questions we get is, why would you choose the R5 versus the R5C? So, of course, the R5 came out first. This was the uh, the photo first camera, if you like. So fantastic stills, still did some great video, yep. um, but people wanted it to be more vo um, video orientated. So that's why we um, designed the R5C, yep. basically. Um, so this is a video first camera, but still takes great stills. I think that video first, photo first way of looking at it is fantastic because, mm. you know, both of these cameras take fantastic stills and both of them take fantastic video. Yeah. You know, if you just look at the R5 from a video point of view, that's it's 8K raw still, it's got mm. 4K over sampling. You know, yeah. the amount of video features in the R5 is insane. Yeah. Um, but it's just tweaking various specifics in yeah. terms of how easy it is you know, which one is ever so slightly, which one is it mainly designed around? Is it yeah. mainly designed to make your life easier if you're a video shooter or is it mainly designed to make your life easier, easier if you're a stills mm. photographer? That's it, um, exactly. Um, so that's kind of what we're here to discuss today, kind of what then benefits are if you are more video orientated. Um, what do you gain from going for the from the uh, R5 compared to the R5C? So like I said, we've still got the... Uh, the full frame 8k um video recording mm. um you have got that option to unlock 8k 60 if you mm -hmm. do use use an external power supply which is fantastic now of course not everyone wants to shoot 8k so like you're saying you mm -hmm. have got oversample 4k and full hd so you're still taking benefit from that huge 8k um resolution so you are getting the the um expanded clarity and the reduced um, noise um, but from a stills point of view, you're basically getting the same camera as the R5, so you're still getting the 45 megapixel um, stills out of it. 
What's rather special with this camera is you have got a, um, f a photo and video switch on top, which to the unexpected eye, you might just think, okay, it's just like any other camera. You switch from photo to video, that's it. Um, but with this, when you switch from photo to video, it actually reboots as a mm -hmm. separate camera. So when you're in photo, it's the traditional EOS menu, which is what the R5 and many of our DSLRs, et cetera, have had. Um, but when you switch to video, it reboots into the cinema EOS operating system. So you are actually booting up a cinema camera effectively. So this is great because effectively you can have two different workflows in one camera. So you are getting two in one. Absolutely. Um, and the best UI that is designed specifically for the job that you're doing. You're not exactly. trying to get video yeah. to work inside exactly. the stills UI. And I think that's what people benefit most from when you start using the Cinema EOS operating system on any of our cameras, because they've not changed too much over the years. It just makes sense and works for video. I've heard that from customers so many times over the years. Yeah. You know, it, once you've used a Cinema EOS camera, you sort of feel at home yeah. with most Cinema yeah. EOS cameras. Yeah. That's definitely a strength of the Canon system. Yeah. And, it, and it, yeah, it makes perfect sense to have a stills hybrid camera that yeah. fits into that. Exactly. And it just works. And especially with the, the new v revised versions that the C70 has and now the R5C, there's a few kind of quick features in there. So you literally tap a few buttons at the bottom. You have access to all of your, your main exposure settings all on one screen. So mm -hmm. really nice. And any customizable buttons on there that are numbered, a bit like a Cinema EOS camera, they can all be customized independently from the photo mode. Mm -hmm. So really nice kind of uh, workflow there. Now, because this is a cinema camera, um, you will notice just that slight little bit extra of chunk on the mm -hmm. back, and that is that active cooling system. Um, so there is a fa fan built into there, and what's pretty great about this is it is actually separate from the sensor. So there's no exposed electronics or anything like that, so you are getting the same um, moisture resistance or weather resistance as the regular R5. Um, so if you are out in the field, you don't need to worry too much about a bit of a, a small shower or a bit of dust out there. Mm -hmm. um, so really great for that. Um, and then we will cover a little bit later, but having the professional recording formats in here, so not just the um, MP4, you have got an expanded um, range of options in there, which we will cover, um, along with the dual base ISO. So for low light um, performance, you can get really clean um, yeah, a really clean image in, in low light situations. Um, and then what's really important for a lot of uh, multicam shoots is the fact that it has the built-in time code um, mm. port on there. So it'll actually be able to sync up mm. multiple cameras. Um, so just on the side. Up top there. Mm. Yeah, so that's brilliant. Yeah, when, if you're trying to work within several with several other multi-camera, um, uh, cinema cameras, sorry, they can actually obviously work yep. together um, without any issues there with sync. And then finally, what's um, just recently been announced, actually, is the fact that this is now a Netflix-approved cinema camera. So if you are shooting for any Netflix productions, this is actually on their approved list, which is pretty exciting for a camera, especially at this kind of price point Absolutely. in the range. Yeah, so really exciting points. Um, so kind of moving into some of them to elaborate a bit, um, what we're really kind of proud of is our autofocus um, technology. So... Many people now probably have heard of uh, dual pixel CMOS AF. Um, it's been renowned for really great auto, um, face tracking, eye detection, really smooth transitions, very um, natural. Um, and you have got the eye detection in here. So quick little uh, video if it'll play. So you should be able to see really nice, locks straight onto the eye, does a really good job of it. Um, and then going that step further, this now has what we call EOS ITR AFX. <laughs> Catchy which, name. Uh, yeah, a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> but effectively intelligent tracking recognition um, autofocus. So it actually has what we call deep learning within there. It's not learning as it goes along, but it's been taught by Canon back in Japan what the back of a head looks like. So if that face does disappear, it still knows what to uh, what to lock onto. Yeah. Now, we've took this a step further with the latest um, firmware, which... Um, what we've effectively done is it doesn't even need to see a face before it locks on now. So when you update to the latest firmware, it will actually just knows it actually knows what the back of the head looks like, and it will go straight to the back of the head before mm. the face even appears. So um, really impressive how well this works um, for that kind of solo shooter uh, environment. No, really handy. Yeah. And that's a really good shot to show it off as well. It's a very contrasty shot with yeah. bright, bright background. Exactly, especially with dark good. hair, which Absolutely. A, a lot of cameras might struggle with something like that. Um, now, elaborating on kind of the cinema EOS aspect of this camera, this is where it gets really exciting for me 
when I've personally used it. So mm-hmm. being able to actually fine tune that speed and sensitivity of the um, the autofocus really is where you start to finesse it to make it work Absolutely. for the, your production. This is something I use with what we do here all the time. I, I vary that up and down quite a lot because there are some yeah. shots where I just want the autofocus to stick onto something and exactly, just glue yeah. to it as I, as yeah. I move backwards and forwards. And there's some where I want it to change between subjects. So maybe I'm on that thing, but I put that thing into shot and then it pulls to that. I want it to just be a bit smoother and slower as it does it. And that's why Um, we're kind of at this point now, dare I say it, we can actually say this professional autofocus. Absolutely. Which people have always strayed away from the word because they think autofocus and um, professional don't come in the same sentence. But now with the way this dual pixel works with that kind of Hmm. finessing, um, it does a brilliant job and um, it, it's even trained to work how say a focus puller would and it has a, a curve built into it so instead of it just being a to b one linear speed it will slow yep. down towards eases the subject in, eases yeah, exactly. out i think we we are easily now at the point where the vast majority of professionals i talk to mm. do embrace autofocus if not for yeah. all of their work for at times during their work i think autofocus technology um which I think you guys were one of the first ones to get to this point, but pretty much mm. across the board now, yeah, autofocus yeah. technology is just at a point where it's too good not to be using mm-hmm. it. It makes your job so much easier exactly. and yeah. it just makes you better at what you do. Yeah. And it's got to the point now where I think if you're a working professional in some industries, not in some industries like the really controlled like narrative and all that kind of stuff, mm. but you know, if you should like that example just then of a wedding, for example, mm. If you're shooting that kind of thing and you're ignoring it just out of principle, mm. I would argue you're not. That's not very professional of you. You know they are too yeah. good to ignore. Really, nowadays. exactly. And at the end of the day, it's an aid. It's not going to fully replace what you may do. 100%. Manual focus is always going to have its time and place. Yep. But if it can help you and make your life easier, then there's there's nothing wrong with actually utilising that. Um, and that's where my personal favourite feature oh. is having that face only versus face priority built yep. in. Um, so by default, most cameras kind of out there, they might not call it this, but they've basically got face priority. So if they see a face, they'll focus on that. If the face disappears, they'll focus on whatever else is in the background, yep. which in certain situations works great. Um, however, especially in like interviews, things like that, say if I'm shooting a sit down interview and I'm the only one that can interview them, if the camera is left running over my shoulder by itself. I need to know that it's not going to start hunting in the background for different things. If that person bobs out a shot, something like that. So switch it into face only. And the second that face disappears for any reason, it will just kill the autofocus and it will only continue yep. when that face basically comes back. So really kind of handy feature there for solo shooters, especially. And again, it's something I use all the time being swap and swapping between the two of them all of my piece to cameras for pro v are in face only you know i Mm. only ever want it to focus on my face i don't want it to stray to anything else exactly but as soon as i swap over to filming b-roll i go to face priority yeah it's a no-brainer and you can easily with the customizable buttons just set it up so just like that press a button you're in face only press it again you're back in priority um and then tracking a bit more familiar with with um a few other cameras now but just being able to uh press a button and then you can click anywhere on the screen and it will lock onto that subject so a bit like a face but it can be any subject you like really so really nice tracking there now a big talking point around um around these cameras is the stabilization. Now, I know there's perhaps not a a bit of clarity sometimes on people um, wondering why this camera has electronic stabilization versus um, uh, in-body stabilization, so IBIS. Mm -hmm. So we focus with this camera over the R5, uh, an electronic stabilization. And the reason for that is just having that control. So being able to fully disable it if you are using um, other stabilization methods, if you're using gimbals, tripods, etc., you don't want your sensor moving about. You want to be able to turn everything off mm. and you use your own stabilization. Uh, but when the time comes and you need just to get rid of a bit of that micro jitter or something, perhaps if you're doing a bit of handheld work, just being able to enable that digital or electronic stabilization in camera, it's enough just to get rid of and give you that kind of nice smooth mm flow in a way um and the way this works is because of the new mount so the rf mount um you actually get a a more clever um stabilization so the new mount has 12 pins on it now whereas the ef mount only had eight so because of that the communication um is a lot quicker so a lot more accurate and it means that the stabilization can actually talk back and forth with any lens that has stabilization Mm -hmm. um so if you're using anything with is 
stick it on an, uh, the RF body and you can get up to eight stops of IS depending on kind of the combination. So you can get really um, good stabilization that's working together, not just separately. And so many of the RF lenses now have image stabilization. Exactly. In them. Um, yeah. So yeah. you said before that, that trinity of lenses, the, um, mm. the 16, 15 to 35, yeah. 24 to 17, 7200 all have really great yeah. IS. All 2S and 2.8 and with IS, yeah, mm. which, is, which is great. So work, uh, having these as a combination is brilliant. And then, of course, because this is a cinema camera, you might want to use maybe some, um, some manual focus glass. You can put that on there and in the camera, you can say what the focal length is. So say you're using a 50 mil, you mm -hmm. enter that. And then it, the electronic IS will then compensate for a 50 mil lens. Mm -hmm. So it can still work well with non RF lenses or even any of our yeah, cinema lenses. Absolutely. So it works really nice. It does work far better than I think people would expect from a mm. digital system. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people just dismiss anything that is sort of electronic and digital. Exactly. Sort of warping, yeah. Yeah. And they don't trust it. Yeah. Um, of all the systems out there that I've seen, this one works really nicely. Mm, exactly. And that's why it's basically included in all of our cinema cameras, so all the way yep. up to the, well, the C500 Mark II. Canon are a very protective company over things like that and what they put, mm. especially in those higher-end cinema cameras. Yeah, they yeah. wouldn't put something like a digital image stabilization into those cameras if mm. they didn't believe in it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And and the best way I set it up, because, again, there's a time and a place, you just customize a button, you press a button, and just like that, it's on, and then when you're sure. done with it, you turn it back off. So really easy to switch between it before we move on shall we go through some people's questions so this yeah, might sure. be a bit of a tangent away from okay. a lot of other things um so i think the first question that came in was from vanity affection can you not set audio levels on the built-in microphone these options are grayed out and i can't find help anywhere um so that's the manoral built-in scratch yeah. mic. So I believe you can't set them because it is only a scratch mic. So it's mm. there just for reference if you try and sync audio of any other audio device. Um, so, so I guess that would on be or off. on or off. And in, when it's set on, it's on automatic levels. Yeah, so levels, it would be on I automatic guess. level, yeah. so it never peaks, just so you've got that kind of backup. Absolutely. Um, a few people asking about the digital teleconverter. That's something, yes. in, is that in the new firmware? That is, yes. Okay. Is, do we have um, slides on that coming up? We do have slides on that okay. later. Yeah. I'll save yeah. those questions, sorry guys, <laughs> until later when we get to the slides. Stick around the slides might answer them. Yeah. Um, this guy's asking, when will Canon release a low-light beast to compete with the <laughs> Sony A7S and the FX line? Um, it's an interesting one, because th those are very good cameras in low-light, particularly the FX6, which has much less noise reduction. So I prefer the FX6. Um, they are probably still the best cameras out there. But even with less noise reduction, they still have quite a bit of noise reduction. And mm. so, um, I don't know, there's some situations where I do prefer cameras that don't quite have that, you know, <laughs> dual base of 10,000 or whatever it is. I think yeah. it's yeah. 12,800 um, on the FX6 and A7S Mark III. Um, when you're in extreme, extreme low light, that's amazing. But when you're mm. just, you know in a village at night time or, you know, the streets of Rome at night time or whatever. Yeah. Um, sometimes it can be a bit, a bit too far and actually you get a better result mm. in those mid ISOs with in Sony's yeah. cam lineup, the ones which don't have that sensor, but also, mm. you know, your, your ones, what, yeah. what are your thoughts it's, on that? It's one of them that, that there's always going to be a need for a, a different type of camera and a, a low light beast, as we were saying. And, um, I think Canon, we're always looking at, new and upcoming um, cameras, obviously, and what we think we should bring to the market. And, of course, this is something that's looked at probably years in advance, and they're always thinking, okay, what's our next move? Mm. Um, and if the demand's there, then I'm sure we would look into it. Um, but like you're saying, not necessarily everyone needs it to have, like, a base ISO of 10,000 or whatever it may be. Um, for most people, as long as they can shoot at a relative um, high ISO, so 6,400, et cetera, that's good enough for indoor shooting with a bit of light, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's one of them. We'll just have to wait and see what comes kind of in the future. That does kind of um, link on to what I was going to talk about next, which was the oh, there we go. the dual base ISO, which um, this camera is pretty unique. It's the only one in um, well, all of our range that actually has that in there. So um, the base ISO with this, it does vary slightly depending on um, what gamma settings you're in. Yep. So if you're in, say, log three or raw, it's um, base ISO of 800, 3200 um etc uh but it does mean that in low light situations because you can increase that base iso you are going to get better low light results and i've seen some test footage up to say 12,800, and it's pretty usable especially if you're using a little bit of the um noise reduction built in or you apply your own after 
um, it's good enough for most situations. Mm -hmm. um, so they have kind of catered for that with this camera. That's kind of the idea there, just to in improve that low light um, situation, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and these cameras are good in low light. I, I get exactly, customers yeah. surprised by how good they are yeah. a lot, yeah. actually. Yeah. They do really quite well. Yeah, especially bearing in mind you've got a 45 megapixel sensor exactly. in there. So Which I think might be why they're not expecting the world in terms of yeah. low light performance. Because their they pixels are a lot go, tinier mm, versus yeah, obviously a lower, lower megapixel. So there is that. But the fact you've got 8K video in there and it can perform with a base ISO of say 3200 I think yeah. that's that's great the oversampling helps because yeah. oversampling yeah. naturally lowers down the noise floor and hides noise anyway mm. so in 4k oversampled you definitely get better low light exactly and that oversampling is always happening at anything um 4k mm. 60 or under so you're always going to get the best kind of image that the camera can pr produce out of it really mm. yeah should we just churn through a couple of these other yeah, quick sure. ones? Um, Charles says, we would like to know if Canon will address the Wi-Fi preview via an iPhone device, which works in the R5, but not in the R5C. Will Canon address this in any firmware update or any other solutions? I imagine that's because the stills app will give you a, a low res mm -hmm. image preview, whereas the Cinema EOS so UI it, uh, doesn't, right? Uh, what, so what was the question again sorry so canon will address the wi-fi preview via an iphone device which works in the r5 but not in the r5c so I'm assuming they mean because of the um the canon um, app for yeah. for preview with cinema eos because it is a separate operating system it doesn't have that it doesn't same talk to app that and work system. in the same way yeah, because you are effectively running one of our cinema cameras, so they're not yep. usually designed to be using that same app. I so believe I guess that's the, the what question we're... really is, when are you going to bring mm. Wi-Fi preview over an iPhone app to the Cinema EOS system, the mm. operating system? That, I think, would, would probably be... Yeah, I think it all comes down to demand, and if we think there's enough demand there, then mm. it will definitely be something that's that's added in the future. Um I'll have to check, but we do have some live preview um, software already. I know you can on your um, iPad, I've seen people mm. use, but it's been a while since I've um, tried that one out. But. I think it might need a separate um, device. I, again, it's been yeah, a while since I've had a look at that one. Um, we've also got a question about battery life. So does the battery mm. life improve on the R5C when shooting in 1080p? Um, I think... I don't think it does because it's got to oversample so much. Yeah, right? yeah. It might improve if you crop in and shoot 1080p, but using the yeah. full sensor, it might not. Yeah, that I've might not be something I've we not can tried it. Yeah, maybe we could play with an, an answer here. Yeah, because yeah, like Carl was saying, the the fact that um, the whole time, even in full HD, it is oversampling from 8K. So there's a lot of pixels that are being um, moved down into that full HD resolution. I know when I changed between the full HD and 4K, the battery life was still estimating as the same. Yeah, so full sensor, I've just gone from 4K UHD to um, 1080p in 50, and it's gone it, both at seven minutes. This battery's on its way out. <laughs> uh, and if I, cr that's using full frame. If I crop into Super 35 and go to 1080p, still seven minutes. And what about Super 16? No, it's still saying seven minutes on all of them, which okay. is interesting. Well, so we no, do, it doesn't look like it does. We do have a way to improve that, which we are going to cover later because there is something that's been added with mm -hmm. the uh, with the firmware in terms of um, battery saving. So there might be something, a little caveat there that might be able to, to help out. Mm. Um, are Canon ever going to come out with a way of transmitting their autofocus info to follow focus motors? That would be a really mm. interesting idea. I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> That's the first time I've heard So that. a readout from the camera as to what it thinks the lens yeah. should be doing with autofocus, but that you can plug into a yeah. something to drive a manual That's, stills lens. That's clever. That is clever. Um, I can't say... I like that idea. Um, I've discussed it personally. We never know what um, the, the guys back at Canon Inc. have, uh, have been discussing, but yeah. I mean, it's one of them. If you think focus pullers are now starting to consider our dual pixel autofocus and think it could actually benefit them, mm. then you never know. Maybe it could Great. be something that could be useful. Of course, so many questions <laughs> coming in. <laughs> uh, 
uh, wait, the battery life is seven minutes on the R5C. No, it's just that this oh, battery no, no, I yeah. happen to have here <laughs> in this camera is, is yeah. very nearly nearly dead. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't put a clean battery in before before starting no, the stream. No. No. Don't worry, you get way more than seven <laughs> minutes out of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think I usually, depending on the modes you're recording, in, you're looking on average around 45-ish minutes, yeah. um, depending on, yeah, if you're shooting RAW and, and XFABC, etc. Um, fantastic question from from Max. Have you encountered any challenges or limitations while using the R5C? Have you man, how have you managed or overcome them? That's okay. a really interesting one. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, the battery life is probably what yeah. the customers talk about as the main limitation mm. of it. You know, um, particularly Cinema EOS customers are very used to on the C70 and C300 Mark III. Mm. Um, slapping on a bpa 60 and <laughs> just being able to shoot for hours yeah, and hours and hours on day. one battery yeah. um there isn't an equivalent of that inside the canon mm. system on the r5c yeah. um the way we overcome it for customers is to give them a little tool set of options mm. so you can you can have it stripped down with just um the lp6 you can have it with the power bank plugged into usb c to take power delivery which will give you the 8k60 mm. you can plug in a um a V-lock, or there's even some accessories like the little tilter PD handle, which is yeah, a really nice great. one to pair I with it. I think that gives you like three hours of 8K, About. so probably even longer at 4K. So for the people who haven't seen that, that is a side handle that um, has an internal built-in battery, mm. yeah. but still keeps your battery slot free. Yeah. So you can um, you can run power off that, and then when it dies, just use the normal LP6. Mm. But that and one LP6 afterwards, that would get you through like yeah. four and a half hours. Exactly, which is probably going to be most people's shoots exactly. realistically. So, exactly. Yeah, and we have got a little bit on the, the power solutions, but I think that's the main sure. thing, people understanding that you are running a cinema camera operating system on a battery, which is obviously... Yeah fairly small in comparison to what you get with our cinema cameras oh absolutely um, and these uh, things are tiny and in terms of capacity they're only what 40 watt hour or something like that 16 watt hour yeah, yeah. <laughs> 16 it is, so in- <laughs> it is worth uh, pointing out that um even though you can use any of the lpe6 batteries it's worth using if you can the the latest one which is yes. the lpe6 nh h5 yes. capacity that's a good point we'll so any of them with the hologram on the side of them is the best way to to notice oh, that it. oops oops <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that that one is an NH. Yeah, yeah, and that will give you the, the maximum um, capacity because they are designed just to work a little bit more efficient than the previous models. But yep. there's nothing wrong with using the older batteries. Just be aware the battery life won't be quite as good for that. Yep, James Jackson Films recommends the Core SWX um, Edge Link batteries. Great battery okay. solution. Yeah, sure. There's quite a few really good ones now um, mm. for it. So there's lots of options out there. Um there's the questions are coming in thick and fast now we're answering them um should we pause for a little bit on some questions and do a few more slides just yeah, sure. otherwise we might run out of time um let's fine. shoot through some slides and then we'll come back to yeah. questions in in we'll come back. five or ten yeah that's fine so um what's really exciting about this camera um especially as you move from the the regular r5 is just that expanded range of options of recording formats yeah so of course we still have cinema raw light in the regular r5 but you have got three versions of it in here so you do yeah. have light which is technically a cinema raw light light if you like um standard and hq so you've got three options there to choose between depending on your workflow how much um obviously um file size you want to create um but they would up to 8k 4 for 4 12 bit if you're going for really the high end mm. and what's great about our cinema raw light codec is um compared to our regular raw which i've seen like the c700 mm. um is about a third of the size and to be fair this file size isn't much different in certain settings anyway than the xfabc so raw is no longer in that kind of area where you're like oh it's a miles ahead in terms of file size and processing etc mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. actually now coming down into that kind of space where people can actually with just a single like mac or something can actually handle it which oh, is absolutely. brilliant for the flexibility so just being able to change your, your white balance your iso um all within um that smallish file size is is brilliant and which editing systems does cinema raw light now working per- um, natively i believe currently it's uh premiere pro and final court so i've not mm-hmm. checked with davinci resolve. um but yeah i, I think, think it does with resolve pretty yeah. sure it does i'd have to check but i think think so anyway um but yeah with those two anyway i know with that uh it, it will automatically read it you don't necessarily need to install the plugin but we do have a standalone plugin 
if you do want to convert it as well, which is great. Um, now, the most popular codec for a while now in a lot of our pro video cameras is the XFAVC. It's a really nice um, codec. You've got up to 810 megabits um, in all eye, uh, which is brilliant. That's that's what's so great about this codec is it's a really robust one with lots of data there. So you're kind of going to get the best image quality out of it in yeah. a reasonable kind of size. And then the most talked about one at the minute is the HEVC. So this is kind of seems to be the way the industry is kind of going because as long as you have a computer that can kind of decode it yep. it's about a third of a size of, of regular h.264 um but without losing any quality and it, it's a lot so smaller we now i made a video about this a month or so ago we we now use hevc for every mm. single one of our videos um yeah on the channel um the quality is fantastic and on apple's m1 chips or above with mm. their macs it just edits it edits it like butter yeah it's really made my workflow so much easier yeah. and rather than having like 200 gigabytes worth of files for every <laughs> single video that i make here yeah. i've now got maybe 40 to 60 yeah. gigabytes it Which makes a big difference that's gonna add up over the years and i've got a big hard drive <laughs> behind me yeah, but yeah. it was running out of space <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i think it's it seems to be the way the industry is kind of going so i definitely think it's going to be adapted more and more as, yep. as we go along and it's still 42 10 bit so more than enough flexibility there in, in post as yep. well um james has just confirmed it does work in resolve yeah i thought it did oh brilliant that's good then thank you james um Thank you. And then uh, H.264, so your regular MP4 codec, which um, still a lot of people want if they just want a quick, nice, easy file to, to drop straight online. Um, but what's quite interesting now is, so we, we already had the Atomos ProRes RAW, mm. but they've now, um, in collaboration with Canon, released a plugin, effectively, which gives you a lot of the... Um, capabilities of regular raw so so this is fascinating because th i saw this news release came out and i kind of went what yeah because the cameras <laughs> the, the camera's been able to output raw for ages it has and yeah. Yeah. I, I was recording um progress raw on the r5 years yeah. ago yeah <laughs> with yeah. it when the camera first came out onto a ninja 5 <laughs> and editing it in um in final cut with no problem mm. Um, and it, it took a little bit to figure out actually what had happened here. So it, so it's a plug-in for Final Cut, yep. which gives you all of the raw, it, gives, it sort of expands what you mm. can do with that raw inside yeah. Final Cut. Yeah. And it gives you the much more familiar and traditional sort of sliders for ISO yeah. and white balance. And exactly, yeah. So it's effectively what our Cinema Raw Lite codec will give you, but in a ProRes format. Mm. So if you prefer the ProRes workflow, then it's effectively giving that very similar um, principle. Um, hopefully going forward, it might then move into some of the other NLEs as well. But mm. to begin with at the minute, it's uh, in Final Cut. Final Cut. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of the other NLEs give you some of that out of the box. Like, mm. I believe them. Um, uh, actually, that's a good point. I think Premiere does. And yeah. Resolve doesn't do yeah. Pro as well. Um, it really should. <laughs> that's a yeah. whole separate issue. <laughs> um Cool. Should we pause for a few more? Sure, yeah. Well, there's so many in here. Uh, thank <laughs> you guys for all the questions. It's brilliant. Um, why is there no subject tracking in slow motion, Jules Goes says. Um, so is there no... Um, there is autofocus in slow motion. Right? There is autofocus, yeah. just not face tracking or eye detection um, currently in there. So I know it is in, say, the C70, that sort of thing, but um, it's something that's been fed back. Um, yeah. So we can all only... It's only just made it. So that was in the latest update yes. for so it was the added into the, into the C70. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. it's something that comes... Yeah. You could, well, that we'll wouldn't, to, we'll wouldn't necessarily to be too much of a stretch for the imagination <laughs> to think that it might be coming. Yeah, we're, we'd That'd like be to nice. think so. But we'll, yeah, but we'll see if the demand's there and, um, yeah, everyone seems to really require that feature, then hopefully uh, we'll see it added in there. You can add my name onto the, uh, onto the, <laughs> yeah. the petition sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Max is asking, is there any official Canon accessories or adapters available to allow auto variable ND capabilities on the R5C? Um, oh. So by auto variable ND, I assume he means like Sony have where it's the electronic ND, which will let you do auto exposure, but oh, by okay. only by controlling yeah. your, yeah. your um, ND. Which is a fantastic system. I uh, no, there isn't. As far no, as I'm no. aware, any there's Quite definitely not no, any Canon, but like that. I don't think there's any third-party ones that will give you an END system on. 
Canon yeah. have their lens mount, which has a variable ND in the side, but yeah. it's a traditional variable yeah, ND. Like a, yeah, like a scroll kind of variable ND. Um, I know for people that I had a question like this the other day where they was asking, how can I kind of get that smooth transition um, in yep. the variable ND? The nice thing is if you're using RF lenses, the um, the stops between the the aperture numbers are actually a lot um, a lot smaller. So if you do want to change your exposure without seeing the steps in the aperture, you can actually compensate just by turning it on in the menu. So having them smaller increments actually hides the fact that you're using the aperture of the lens. So uh -huh. if you are trying to adjust your aperture, uh, sorry, your exposure slightly without touching the ND filter, you literally just adjust the um, the aperture and the the aperture blaze will compensate for that. So. So that's another way around. That's really useful. Um, someone has just asked, do you have a link um, to the Final Cut Raw workflow? I've just put the link down in the um, thing. So that link goes to Canon's press release. We'll explain a little bit more about what mm -hmm. it is. And then that has a link to their support page where yeah. you can download it. So you download it the same place as you download firmware from the R5C. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's move on. Um, <laughs> this is... Probably the biggest question I've ever heard about the R5C <laughs> is, is there any chance C-Log2 will be added to the R5C <laughs> by a firmware update? That's the burning question. The burning question. <laughs> um, I know there's obviously the demand there. It probably comes down to a couple of things. Um, so, yeah, I know the demand's there, so it will have been fed back. Um, but it's also what the sensor is capable of. Yeah. Because you have got a 45 megapixel sensor, so a lot more pixels there, it's if it would physically be able to take advantage of that C-Log2 because yep. bear in mind how much extra dynamic range that gives you. Um, if the sensor is not capable of doing that, then there's no point adding it. Yep. Um, and some brands would add it. Yeah. But like I said earlier, traditionally, mm -hmm. Canon have always been quite a sort of yeah. conservative and reserved company with what they put yeah. into their, their we, products, knowing sort of, I want I only want to put it in when it works, mm. kind of. We'd rather kind of, kind of put the official stamp on it and say, we're exactly. including this because it works flawlessly. It gives you the best image possible. If we don't think it's going to give you the best results, there's no point adding it because then people won't be happy with that. We'd rather have C-Log3 and know that it works fantastically. And for most yep. people's workflow, C-Log3 does a fantastic job. It's a lot easier to work with especially for quicker turnarounds yep. um, over C-Log2. I actually get better results grading. C-Log3 is not a better log format. I need to be careful the way I say it. Mm. C-Log3 is not a better log format than C-Log2. C-Log2 is beautiful log format. Mm. And we've got customers who create incredible stuff with C-Log2. Yeah. Me personally, not being a colorist, mm. I get better results yeah. outside in direct sunlight with C-Log3 than I do with C-Log2 mm. because I know how to grade <laughs> my C-Log3 <laughs> easier yeah. um, than C-Log2. Yeah, because um, yeah, you're getting a lot more information in the shadows in C-Log2, so that's a lot more extra work for you to do if if you don't necessarily need that extra dynamic range in, exactly. in the shadows. Uh, right, so James posted, and I think he's just posted, sorry for the repeat question, and reposted it again. Um, do you think there's any chance Canon will update the R5C to record in 3x2 open gate? It's really the only one of the cinema line that has the capable sensor. That is a really good point, actually, James. Yeah. Really good point. The sensor's covered up. Of course it is. Uh, I do love that <laughs> feature, though, while we're while, while it's accidentally yeah, come yeah. up. The, the shutter closes down when the camera's off over the sensor so that I can do that, take my lens off, and I'm not going to get dust all over my sensor, which is a fantastic yeah, thing. Yeah, that's probably one of my favourite things because um, the amount of dust on your sensor me up boys. just then. But if I turn the camera on and then take the lens off, it won't do it. And, yeah, there's a lovely 3 by 2 <laughs> sensor in it, of course, from the still side. Um yeah. It would be fantastic for anamorphic. He's not wrong. Yeah, That's I, I wouldn't, dis I wouldn't disagree. Um, it's one of them that, again, if the demand's there and people would really benefit from that and we, we think that it's worth worth um, adding in, then I'm sure we would. Um, but we don't have any official um, line or, or comment currently on if that would be added. I know that we've got anamorphic support in there, which is, which is great. So you can actually de-squeeze in camera. Um, so great if you want to um, export that. Yep. Um, sorry to like a like an Atomus, just to be able to physically see it there in real time. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, currently nothing like that. Which is great. Pair that with an open gate mode, and it would be a really okay. capable little yeah. camera. We've got Barry Griffin in the. Hello, Barry. We've got Barry in the <laughs> hello, thing. Barry. Starting to. He's, he's obviously been told that we're getting loads of questions. <laughs> he's jumped in. <laughs> Barry, in for anyone wondering, Barry Griffin um, down there. 
works at Canon as well. And yeah. will be very helpful. He's not helpful. just a keen fan. <laughs> He's not just a keen... Well, he is a keen fan. Well, I guess he is, that, yeah. That's kind of his job role, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Parry Griffin, super fan. Right, so I've just <laughs> put a link to a CF Express. I'm just trying to find the question. Oh, there, Leslie said, what CF Express Type B cards would you recommend for 4K recording brand and capacity? It is really hard for me not to recommend these Angel Bird um, SE cards. The 512 gigabyte Angel Bird SE card is fast enough for every single mode that the camera can do. It's There's faster CF Express cards on the market by a long way, but this is fast enough for everything that this camera and nearly every other camera on the market right now anyway mm. can actually do. And it... it is 150 pounds x fat at the moment 180 in fat it is so much cheaper than mm-hmm. every other cf express card on the market we sell loads and loads of those cards for very good reason it just makes so much sense you know you can buy four of those for any other brand mm-hmm. sd um cf express yeah. card people get nervous at that price point because of <laughs> that but it, i've tested it angel bird are a fantastic company they it's not quite as well built physically as their other cards but it's really still quite nice and still better built than an sd card is mm. um i think it's a fantastic product couldn't yeah. recommend i think it as long as it meets the specifications for for the um recording format you're going to record in yep. then th- there's a huge range of options, but yeah, Angel Bird are one of them. There's a SanDisk, um, ProGrade. Um, they all make some great cards that Absolutely. all kind of meet that spec, really. Right. Um, I recently picked up the R5 over the R5C while shooting outdoors in a shaded construction site. The camera would only record for five minutes on 4K. Wow, where are you filming? That must have been hot. <laughs> Would the Canon R5C have the same issue? No. No, no because it is a video-first <laughs> camera. So, like I said, the R5 is more photo-orientated, but yep. it has that cooling on the side. Excellent. The big so, fans on the side, that is what the R5 is missing. That was the R5's big weakness for video, that this camera mm-hmm. was released to address, really. Yeah. Um, that's so exactly. as long as your battery and your card will go, it'll just keep going, yep. basically. So nothing to worry about there. Why won't Canon let us use video on the R5 side, given the better autofocus system and low light performance with regard to autofocus? Um, okay, so the, the low light performance you might have a point with in, in terms of it will autofocus at slightly lower exposure levels than right. the cinema side of the thing. I disagree with the better autofocus thing. I've seen this around a lot on the mm. internet that the still side of this has a more advanced version of Canon's autofocus than the video side. Mm. It doesn't. It just has different technology in the operating system for it. Personally, I find the, particularly the eye tracking on the still side to be slightly more sticky and gluey and will recognize a subject better. But I would rather have the adjusting of the still of the speed mm. and, and sensitivity yeah. and the face priority and, and yeah, face only. That's the big thing there. I would rather have those two than have the slightly stickier, uh, particularly mm. at lower light yeah. um, tracking focus. Yeah. Um, I think it's because you have to bear in mind that Cinema EOS operating system doesn't talk to the regular EOS operating system. They are completely They're different absolutely. systems. And that's why the camera reboots like Exactly, that. Yeah. yeah. So th- there's not a way for them to speak back and forth. It's either one or the other. But of course, absolutely. we're always, like with our updates and what we've added recently, we're always looking to improve that autofocus and tweak it to, yep. to improve it as we go along. Absolutely. Um, what he is right, though, is that even on the R5 side of the camera, so in photo mode on the R5C, mm. you can't record any video, even right, just a, right, yeah. a lower res one yeah. i would love to see that would be a fantastic thing add my list add my name onto the list <laughs> of requests for that one yeah. as well <laughs> um right let, let's just knock through a couple more i think we're nearly up to date um okay. okay slater studios would it be better to shoot cinema raw light or can you shoot XFAVC C logs three to better match a red Komodo? What would realistically be the best codec to shoot in? Interesting question. Okay. I mean, it has a very different look to the red Komodo. Um, mm. I mean, shooting in RAW will work fine with for both. You know, but by yeah. shooting in RAW, you should be able to, if you know what you're doing, mitigate any differences in mm. terms of the color science between the two brands yeah. and all the rest of it, and make one look like the other. Yeah. Um, pretty simply. Um, I mean, it would be, he says, which one's the best codec? 
cinema roll light. Yeah, I think so. Because just you have to bear in mind that when you're shooting in log three or any other um, gamma that's not not in the raw format, of course, you're still baking in things like sharpness and any kind yes. of tweaking that the sensor's doing to process that image, whereas raw isn't processed. Absolutely. So you're going to be able to tweak it a lot better in that option. Exactly. Bring the raw in from the red Komodo, bring the raw mm. in from the R5C, and you should be able to tweak those to your heart's content. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, I think... There, there. Jules says, thanks for the recent update and subject and face tracking in 60 frames a second and switching time from photo to video. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that leads us nicely on to maybe <laughs> we're starting to run out of time now. Shall we yeah. skip maybe ahead we'll in some of the slides? We'll skip ahead with some of this. I think we've, um, we've covered quite a lot. Oh, do we um, want to talk a little bit about this? Talk just about power, yeah. I know it's quite a nice slide it. for it. Um, so as I was talking before, uh, we are running a Cinema EOS operating system on an LP6N H battery, which is obviously yeah. quite a small battery for powering a video yeah. camera effectively. So the things to bear in mind if you're buying one of these cameras is how you're going to power it. So A, of course, you just buy lots of batteries, which some people might work, keeps the camera nice and light, but there's loads of ways to power it now. So you can power it off of the um, DC coupler, which effectively is like a dummy battery that goes into it. So if you want to plug yeah. it straight into the wall, that's a great option. Um, you can power it from a USB-C power supply. So even some phone chargers now, if they're above, I think, I believe 45 watts, um, you can power the camera mm. continuously just via the USB-C port um, on the side there. Does, does it? No, it just has USB. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I believe over 45, 45 watts. watts. Okay. Yeah. So um, a lot of like, um, I think like Anchor Power Bricks and mm. them sort of brands, they should be, able to, yeah, should be able to power it there. Um, and even any kind of power bank. So again, if it has that PD delivery, power delivery, um, it's actually going to be able to power it for a lot longer than the battery by itself would. Um, and like we said, there's a tilt of power grip as well that can uh, attach there. So as long as you've got some way to power it, it's just worth bearing in mind that you build your rig effectively around that um, external power solution, really. Absolutely. Okay. And if you add to that all the third-party ones that we talked about, like the batteries, the V-Lock batteries, the batteries that yeah. will live underneath the camera, the tilter one that lives on the side, all those things, You, I think... What I tend to recommend to customers is just get yourself a little tool kit of different power mm. options. Yeah. And then pretty much any situation you find yourself in Adapt with these, the you've got something that's going to work. Exactly. That's One it. quick little question I've just seen pop in. Sure. Um, on the last question while shooting on a, well, oh, sorry, one last question from them. While shooting on a single point focus mode, if the focus spot is on a plain color, like a white wall or a black TV, the autofocus goes hunting backwards and forwards all the way. Is this a normal occurrence or a faulty camera? It's normal. I think it's normal, yeah. That is completely normal. I mean, any autofocus system from any brand will need some contrast and detail Something, to be able yeah. to tell when you're in focus. So yeah. if you just point it at a white wall, like one of these ones here in the thing, or mm. your example of a black TV, if yeah. there is nothing in that autofocus point that it can recognize, if it's just yeah. pure color, it, it can't yeah. do its job. It's, and I think, yeah, any camera really will react like that. Um, exactly. And Barry's just chimed in to say the same thing. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> um, cool. Let's let's move on okay. to the next slide. Um, should we move past oh, this? VR. Let's let's just talk about it super quick. Yeah, We're going to end up wanting to talk about it? every slide, aren't I? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the little note there in the middle: achieving VR um, shooting with a single sensor provides a simpler mm -hmm. VR workflow that eliminates the need for stitching after shooting. I think yeah. this is something that people absolutely forget about with this camera: mm -hmm. is that you pair that high resolution 8K. 8K60 as well yep. with your weird Dual fish bug eye. lens, yep. um, the fisheye one. Um, yep. It is the simplest VR camera workflow. Yeah. And there's nothing the really market. out there like it either. Yeah. So the fact you've got that 8K sensor, you've got 60 frames a second, which is kind of needed for nice smooth VR. Mm. It's actually resolving VR that when you put on a, a good um, headset, mm. it actually looks lifelike. I've seen it at the trade shows where you've shown it up. I've never actually tried it for myself. I really should try mm. and organise to get all the kit in one place and and try that out. I'd yeah. love, to, love to try. Because it just seems to be the way it's that. going. And of course, now we've like Apple announced their um, yeah. new headset. So yep. um, there's only going to be the demand growing for, um, yeah. for VR um, content. Absolutely. Very interesting. But I, I imagine the majority of people watching this don't do VR work. So yeah, yes, it's quite anyway. a specialist um, area, At the moment but you never know. You maybe, never know. Maybe in a few years time yeah. it won't be. Exactly. Yeah. Let, yeah. Let's see. 
Um, so now we're on to the anticipated area, I guess, is the uh, the firmware update. So we have recently announced or released um, for the majority of our Cinema EOS range. We're only going to cover the R5C today, um, but there's a bit of overlap there as well um, in terms of what we've, we've released. So there's a lot of exciting things uh, brought in here. So one of the most biggest things for me personally and i think someone might mention in the comments is mm -hmm. that improved switching time um so we know from feedback people wanted the camera to be able to switch that a little bit quicker because the boot up time between photo and video was a little bit slower so now they've increased by five seconds from video to photo and then back the other way around two seconds i was testing it out and it looks to be about three seconds back and forth between each mode and it's consistent both ways yeah exactly so as you can tell from those faster ones there it was yeah. eight seconds um between going between video and photo yeah and five seconds going between photo and video which you could tell the difference so you, you sort could. of you yeah. could never remember which way around it was and so yeah. it, one way was sluggish and you couldn't remember which way it was yeah having it yeah. consistently be a couple of seconds yeah. either way. And, that, and that's nothing really. That should hopefully yeah. be enough of, of a shorter period to be able to quickly switch back and forth if you are that on-the-go hybrid shooter yeah. literally is switching back and forth between photo yeah. and video. It um, feels much faster. Yeah, definitely. And then adding to that, there's also now a power saving mode. So if you do, if you are in one of those situations where perhaps you're on your last battery or you just need that extended time, you can enable the power saving mode, which will give you an extra um, around 10 minutes in 4K60 with the default settings. Um, there's a few things it restricts in order to do that. So um, you won't be able to shoot anything 8K or higher um and no slow motion and then powering any um external devices so if you are using like the tascam unit or anything like yes. that um it will restrict all of them just to be yeah. able to save some of that power effectively um but a good compromise if you do want that ex extended time yeah when i've talked to customers about this since it was released it, i sort of tend to say treat this as a yet another one of those tools mm. in your power arsenal rather than sort of some some people saw that on the on the firmware notes and thought yeah. oh amazing they've just <laughs> increased the battery they can't yeah. you can't really do that because the main can't, problem the isn't grew. the camera it's <laughs> that it uses this battery which is exactly. only 16 watt hour yeah so you know you haven't added a nice sort of 20 minute chunk <laughs> onto every single record mode in yeah. the camera no that's it <laughs> uh, and then moving on i know someone asked about this oh yes we did so get a few the, questions um, yeah, we may cover that, but the digital teleconverter. So if you want to get that extra reach out of your um, lens, you can now within the menu go all the way up to three times mm. um, utilizing the 8K sensor um, to actually give you that extended reach. So great if perhaps you don't necessarily have a, an extra long focal length um, to cover yourself there or to be able to change between um, focal lengths in a really sure. quick um, period of time. Uh, I'm just trying to find the original question oh here we go oh, yeah. so robert said is the digital teleconverter in 4k modes using 8k quality directly or only oversampled 4k um i don't really understand what that means or, oh uh, i see so when when you engage when you're in 4k and you yeah. engage digital teleconverter mode yeah is it referencing the full 8k quality to be able to zoom in or is it okay. taking what it already had in 4k once it had been oversampled Okay, yeah, I see what you mean. You see what that's, I mean? That's a good question. That's a very I don't good know question. the answer to. I'd have to um, don't either. have to find out about that one, but it's it's an interesting one. I'm sure we can get back to you. Yeah, very interesting. I think okay. probably I imagine we won't ever hear back. Well, yeah, that. we we can ask. But I mean, we, we might have to do our own tests. I yeah, think, for, that might to might have to be out. the case to see how it's actually working. Um now just going back to VR a little bit there. So mm -hmm. this is particularly well for those that are using the the dual fisheye lens but um initially if you want to check focus because you are getting these two um almost like eye views on the back of the screen you had to magnify in and then move your joystick around to be able to um to check focus whereas now because to make it a lot easier you literally press a button and it'll zoom in um straight to the left or right eye yep. um and then you just press a button and it'll click to the left eye and back and forth vice versa um, so just kind of speeding up that workflow for those uh, within the VR um, world. Handy. So you're not always yeah. looking at this sort of bug fly view. Yeah, exactly. Which, which on the back of a smallish screen on the back of a camera, it's not it's always... A um, bit squinty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it helps to be able to check the focus there. 
Um, we've also added in the custom picture uh, setting. So uh, most people will be familiar with like our wide DR um, BT709, but there's now the Canon 709, which is a slightly mm -hmm. different curve of how it handles the, um, the highlights, but that's now added in there with the ability to um, add that as a look um, to the image that you view on the back of the screen as well, mm. um, along with some uh, tweaks there in the um, white balance in terms of adjusting the gain levels of the, the colours. Nice. Um, so utilising that um, control ring on the lens, so any RF lens now that has that um, uh, control ring right at the front there, um, always been my favourite because you can set it for white balance, ISO, exp anything exposure-wise. But now What do you, you tend to set it to when you're shooting? Mm. For me personally, ISO, ISO. is kind of the first one because then I'll then use the other dials in my hands to set either the aperture or the shutter speed. Yeah. Um, and it just feels nice. It just saves you taking your hands away, having to touch the back of the screen or press another button. It's all kind of there at your fingertips because mm. your focus is there at your fingertips and you zoom. So why not have mm. that kind of extra option um, there at the end? Um, yeah, but now you can actually select that subject. So if there's a couple of faces in the frame, you just twist it mm. and it will jump straight to the other face. Because so. I, I like the sound of that because I sort of haven't really found... So I'm so used to having... My iris on my there top that, one, yeah, my ISO, yeah. and my shutter curve. there, and my ISO here yeah, on the three yeah. dials. Mm. And so I'd never think to reach for it yeah. with anything. And so I've normally set it to white balance, but sort yeah. of end up not using it a huge amount. Whereas subject selection, I quite like the, that mm. idea. Yeah, it's quite a nice tactile being feel. And just going, to oh, swap well. to the next person. Mm. There you go. Push it on the, yeah, on the lens. Exactly. Yeah, makes sense. It's a nice uh, addition. And then uh, continuing on with um, onto the lens support, we've now added the ability to use the um, the mount adapter. So mm -hmm. this was created originally more for the C70 because people wanted that almost full frame field of view with the extra stop of light. Um, but you can now put this on the R5C and it will support it. So if you are using um, uh, like Super 35 lenses, for example, you could put them on there and get the um, the wider field of a view effectively mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so any ef lenses 5.9k in super 35 mode you're going to get that extra stop of light and ma maintain the the full frame field of view mm. so really nice um now as virtual production becomes a really big thing now um this is growing to be ever more important so a lot of demand in terms of syncing with screens because obviously led walls can be a bit of a nightmare um for flickering so sometimes when you're just in your, like your shutter angle your, your shutter speed you can never quite dial it in to get rid of that annoying flicker so we've added in this clear scan uh, resolution with loads of different um, options within there so you can really dial it into that background wall so you're not getting any weird flickering or kind of uh, artifacts on the VR side, this customer yep. here has just said, I also picked up the 5.2 millimeter dual fisheye lens, okay. but he still hasn't figured out how to produce 180 degree images. Is that possible? So still so images. Still images. Because um, you've got yeah. so you, you've got that tool, the software that converts it, yeah. right? That's how you do it in video. Yeah. Will that do a still image as well, do you know? Yeah. Um, I've not actually checked, to be honest. I can't see why it wouldn't, or if not, you'd have to create it into a video and then export the frame from it. That's the other way I can see to make it work. Um, but I'd have to actually, ch I'd have to check on that one mm. um, because traditionally it's been used a lot for, for VR video. But um, I can't see why people wouldn't want to use it for stills as well, mm. potentially. Um, but we'd have to check on that. Yeah, interesting. Mm. Um. Artur is saying button number 12 is a record button, please, because other assignable buttons are useless for your left hand. So that's down there, button number 12. Oh, right. No. Oh, Does it let you is put saying anything? You can't... Um... We're both going to just go silent and flick <laughs> through the menus now, aren't we? Yeah, I think uh, we are. Let's have a look. Button number 12. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, I assume since he's asked the question, you can't do it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it should just let you activate recording, let you map it to any. Yeah, I'm trying to think because I know I have a feeling it might be limited to the buttons that are red because you've got the number 13 on the back and you've also got 10 on the, the top. Um, 
and I'm trying to remember if I've seen the um, mm. the option for it. Yeah, interesting. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure it is there. It's an interesting one to is it useless for left hand. Oh, I see, because you can you can the... reach it underneath. Yeah, I'd be I worried I would accidentally you... hit that too much on the left. Twelve. Oh, there. Or just by by being there. I mean, I I personally using. use it to turn on and off um, face only or fa like okay. face priority that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's and a me good personally, when that. it's got a rig and a cage on, I I don't tend to knock it. It's kind of mm. out of the way there. Mm. Um, but I guess it depends on your shooting style, really. Yeah. Okay, maybe maybe you could use it as a record button. Um, the other thing I quite like for more record buttons thinking about it is the Condor Blue cage kit which has got a top handle with oh, a um, yeah, record, the record button, button on, on it, it yeah. which is quite nice yeah that's great that oh you can assign any buttons to any menu item of course there's that custom way of doing it well, that's what I was trying but um... Um, where you can literally just enter the entire menu can't you so in in the button yeah, you can say through. user setting, and then that gives you your menu thing. But oh, of course, but there's no way of activating recording through a menu. Turning recording yeah. on and off isn't a menu item. That's what I mean. I can't because I've just gone through the full list yeah. of um, items. Yes, but the record. bottom one there lets you just pick oh, any user. menu item. I see, but, but yeah, record there's no, isn't a, a menu there's no item. option to enable that's, recording that's in the menu. Yeah. So you can map pretty much anything to a button yeah. yeah apart from record <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is a shame yeah. yeah it'd be nice to have that added to the list wouldn't it yeah um okay has anything else quickly come through well, i've got one more slide if you like and then really yes on to i mean people anyway. are just debating um which canon cameras to go for basically <laughs> down there. um so finally um a big thing that people have been asking for is in terms of the waveform monitor and the vector scope um, if you have it turned on, you literally just touch it on the screen and it will then enlarge to cover most of the screen. And then you can go a step further and you can now adjust the transparency of that. So if you want it to have it um, a little bit more opaque and kind of see through, um, you can turn it down um, in percentages effectively to kind of overlay it over your image. So really nice instead of having to squint at kind of a smaller waveform in the corner. But then when you're done with it, click it and it Absolutely. disappears into a small format again. That is really important. Mm. Um, so the control ring. Somebody has just asked, can you um, add the iris function to your control wheel like in photo mode? And yes, yes, you can. Control ring. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So anything Just exposure. Check. So iris, shutter speed. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's all of them. And white balance as well. Yeah. There's some interesting chat going on. Um as to whether or not to upgrade an R5 to an R5C or whether to right. keep the R5 and go for a separate camera <laughs> like a C70. I think Barry's chimed in saying C70s are a wonderful camera in his personal choice. <laughs> um, R5C is very much for that hybrid shooter who needs just that mm. one camera. But that's quite an interesting thing yeah. to chat through maybe to finish. It, it depends finish really uh, if there's any limitations to the R5 currently. If there's anything yeah. it's not doing and they think they can benefit from the R5C, then that's perhaps worth switching over. Yeah. But if it's doing everything video-wise that you want it to, there's, it's still a fantastic video camera as well. So Absolutely. you don't necessarily need to move over. So really depends on how they're shooting really and their workflow. Of course it does. Of course it does. Um I know quite a few people who are using the R5C and the C70 as a pair, and that's that's mm. what I do here as well. Um, and it, it's funny, I, I I tend to talk about them as a pair rather mm. than as an A camera or a B camera, yeah, because they kind of aren't an A camera or a B camera. They're mm. each better at some things and they're each yeah. better at other things. Yeah. Um, and so um, they are just two slightly different tools for different jobs mm. whereas we in if you're just shooting video with the uh, normal r5 and the c70 the r5 is definitely a b camera i think mm. to the c70 yeah um but it's a fantastic stills camera mm. um so exactly, it really yeah. depends yeah i mean if you're swapping directly from an r5 to an r5c it is quite a lot of money mm. for how many actual improvements you know if you're yeah. if you're starting from scratch 
to look at the R5C or the mm. R5 and which one should I go for. Yeah. I think if you're a video user, you should just go for the R5C. Oh, yeah, definitely. As simple as that. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're if you're looking at trading in your R5 for an R5C, there will be some customers where that makes a huge amount of sense. Mm. But I think you'd have to very specifically need one like specific thing that the mm. R5C Just does say, like time you. code for example like time code and then yeah. that that one feature alone is worth it because mm. all of a sudden it fits into your yeah. your workflow yeah um that being said there are actually quite a few aren't there because the R5 couldn't have the Tascam unit at the top so yeah so if you want professional XLR, XLR audio yeah 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 so and think, of course overheating yeah so yeah I mean if you're doing small snippets of video then that might not be an issue but if you're going to be recording events and things like mm. that then that that active calling and unlimited record time effectively mm-hmm. is quite a big difference as well and then pri- keeping the still side of the camera effectively the same camera exactly yeah and then price wise um they're almost the same at the minute because of mm. course there's the 500 pound uh cash back on it true there are some with, deals um, on the... also i believe a 200 pound instant save so also exactly. have around 700 pound of of savings as yeah. well absolutely mm. yeah it's, yep so i've just gone on our website it's 200 pounds off at the moment and the 500 pound cash back which is live until um august so you buy it for full price from us well full price minus 200 pounds and then apply on Canon's website for, for the cash pack. Mm. Cool. Okay, yeah. I think that's a really nice right. place to end that. Yeah, um, still brilliant. a couple of questions coming, but I believe Barry is doing a great job of answering <laughs> them. So I'll let Barry just do all the work for us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for that, Tom. It's great Thanks to for having me. Okay, I'm through. And the, the amount of interest from customers um, in the comment section there and how many people were watching this, this live, I think, just shows the amount of interest that mm. there is in this camera. Yeah. Um, it's a really, I think this is the camera that customers have been waiting for Canon to make mm. for a really long time. Yeah. Um, I've, I love using this thing. I mm. think it's a fantastic It just ticks camera. the boxes for so many people. And the fact you, you're basically getting a cinema camera, but in the shape of a, a mirrorless camera effectively. Sure. Um, yeah. I think it's just, just brilliant, uh, especially at the price point. You're getting a, an 8K cinema quality camera. It's um, a hugely powerful yeah. camera. Hugely powerful. Impressive. Excellent. Okay, right. Well, let's leave it there. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Brilliant. Um, Thank you, everyone, for watching. I'll see you very soon. Bye. Yeah, you better. Yeah, you better. Yeah, you better.
We are introducing the AWUE160. This is truly a groundbreaking PTZ. We have a newly developed 4K sensor, and this new sensor technology allows us the highest sensitivity within a PTZ on the market today. In addition, we're the first to introduce an optical low pass filter built into the PTZ. What we also did with the UE160 that's so revolutionary is that we completely redesigned the mechanism in which the PTZ moves. It's much smoother and much more accurate.